Well, first of all, I would like to thank Stan 21 for having me as part of this. I've been out there in the audience, um, not maybe all six years, but probably most of them. And um, so, and since this is my 42nd year, I think it is, in racing, um, I've been doing it a long time. And I, I, sometimes when people ask me to speak, I think it's probably because they want the woman's point of view. Um, and my belief is that racing is a gender neutral sport, not only male dominated because more guys showed up and there's really no other differences um, out there. So my sort of story or the things I'm gonna talk about a little bit have nothing to do with being a woman, it just has to do with my experience in racing and, um, and the fact that I guess I've been able to survive 42 years in racing, which you know, I've learned a few things along the way. Um, and so a lot of people know about my Indianapolis sort of life because I finally did get to India in 1992, but not so much about my background. And without going through my whole bio, I just, you know, I started racing a Ford Pinto in SCCA in 1974. So I've raced sedans predominantly um, and, and raced in SCCA. I've raced in IMSA in different types of prototype cars and also in sedans and GTO, raced against this guy a lot. Um, and, uh, and hung, hung out a lot with Jack talking about the, the, the challenges and the, and the struggles of, of what it takes to be able to stay in racing. But because of that, and I'm coming from a point of view that with the exception of the Ford Pinto and then the Cosworth Vega after that, um, I've never owned my own race car. So I'm not coming from a driver who has prepared their car, who knows who's prepared their car. I was fortunate from 1979 forward that I've always been driving somebody else's car. And I'm still racing in vintage. And people say, oh, what are you running? I'm saying whatever I get asked to race. So I'm still racing other people's cars, which has enabled me to stay in the sport. Um, but I, obviously there have been a lot of lessons learned about that because as a driver, you are going to then be put in a situation where you're going to be in a car that you know nothing about, maybe. And, and you certainly are, I mean, you want to be able to race. And so you want to be able to get in those cars and be able to race. So how do you then um, transition or how do you approach? Because the, the hardest thing you'll ever say as a driver is no thank you. Um, I mean, you just don't ever want to walk away from an opportunity to drive a race car. But at the same time, you also don't want to put yourself in a situation where you're racing a car that is not safe, um, is not well prepared. So that's a very fine line. Um, an example up there was that I raced at the 24 Hours of Le Mans, which was on my, we didn't call it bucket list back then, but it was certainly on my, I got to do this. And I had the opportunity to race with Gordon Spice and Ray Bellum in a Spice chassis with a Ford Cosworth. I mean, I knew that that was a well-prepared car because Gordon Spice designed the car for many years. So, but at the same time, you know, you can never make assumptions. Um, so you have to take responsibility as a driver um, and you have to know what to look for. And I remember walking the paddock, or actually not the paddock, pit lane with Jim Busby back in 1981 saying, Jim, help me know what to look at to know whether this is a good race car or not. It isn't just about lap times. Lynn, um, tell us about your first crash and about this yeah, really so nice thing in the lake here. My first um, incident was my very first race after driver school, and that's the Ford Pinto um, in the water in a lake at West Palm Beach International Raceway, where, you know, oh yeah, I went into the lake, thank you. Yeah, it was before I knew you, Jack. <laughs> so I was um, doing everything I learned at driver school except forgot to follow, you know, to watch the mirrors. I was really looking for my apexes, looking for my corner entries, looking for my breaking points, you know, and then very zoned in on all of that. And the overall leader, you know, when they put about five or six or seven or eight classes together, the overall leader came up to pass me, and I mean, I just totally got caught off guard. So going um, into turn three, lost control, ended up spinning out, and ended up on this body of water that we just thought was a pond. Now this is a full body sedan Pinto and the car did a 360 and stopped. And one of the things I learned there is when the car stops, get out. <laughs> so, I mean, but you know, they said it looked like I walked on water. Fortunately, the door did open so I didn't have to crawl out because we had the, you know, it was just still a sedan. It was my street car. I mean, I raced it on weekends and drove it back and forth to work. Got out, stood at the side of the pond and literally turned around and watched the car go bloop, bloop, bloop car totally was submerged, disappeared. And I'm standing on the side of the track. I was the only evidence that this disaster had I happened. How deep that was. It's deep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
No. So um, the lesson learned there for me was, you know, get out of the car as soon as that car stops. And, and obviously the entertainment of the evening was to go down and watch them pull the car out from, you know, the divers go down and get the car out. Now we are going to show a video of uh, that accident that Lynn had at Riverside Raceway that really threatened her life. And it's a pretty amazing video. Now here's our Corvette coming back up, just making a pass. Into the point of the oh, there's hit. Oh, oh tremendous. Two cars flipping. Oh, the Jag has flipped over very bad. And now a fire breaks out in one of the cars. I'm not sure who is involved in this. That's the probe. The Ford probe is overturned and burning. That's Lynn. You can see Lynn. She's in the car. She's moving her arms. Obviously, she's okay, but the car is on fire. Here's a marshal running up behind. Just a terrific accident here. Three cars involved almost at the start-finish line. You know, obviously, most people that I meet or see, that it's embedded in their brain, particularly if they were there um, about that crash. But obviously, I had no idea what happened. I mean, because Doc was from behind me and, and hit, and then I hit poor Chip, which, you know, just sort of propelled me into that. Um, and, you know, the only real lesson, I mean, and it led to a lot of other lessons behind the scenes, so to speak, that led me to that was, again, get out of the car as quickly as possible. I was fortunate that the car did a rotation about 90 degrees out of the fire, so I was not actually, what that fire was, was from the oil and the, and the fuel because we had just made a pit stop and had a full load of fuel. And, but I had to crawl through the fire, but I was able to not have to deal with the fire while I was still in the car upside down. I didn't know it was upside down, so I released the seatbelt, and I, my injury was actually when my head hit the hit the, the roof. But the biggest thing that came to my mind, fortunately, was not to breathe, and meaning not taking deep breaths, because I'd had a fire once before, a very minor fire, and uh, under the hood. And of course, when you are in a situation, you start to hyperventilate. <gasps> you start doing that, which takes more air into the, your lungs. And I actually got burned my lungs from the fire extinguished chemical when I had that happen. Now that had happened probably three or four years before this. This is the first time I'd ever had a fire since then. And in my head, I was like this computer going on saying, don't breathe, don't breathe, don't breathe, which kept me calm and kept me from just taking shallow breaths. Because they did, you know, have the fire extinguisher guy showed up a little late, but um, it still would have impacted me. So that was the lesson I learned, in particularly from a previous lesson. We are nothing more than human computers. Your brain is literally processing everything that's happening. Even if you don't remember it, you have a recall up there. Um, a week later, I was in the car at Laguna Seca. It was the backup car um, of Klaus's car. Obviously, I wasn't racing. But I was fortunate that the guys at Ford said, do you want to get back in a car? And yes. And so I was a car a week later, had a neck brace on and wasn't feeling all that great. As I pulled out of pit lane, I'm in the same exact type of car with the same wind, you know, windshield, the same windscreen and everything. And I literally saw a replay of the crash. In my, it, I'm, I'm looking through the windscreen, seeing oil and dirt and fuel and everything, even though that's not happening. And <laughs> I remember pulling down pit lane really slow. This was just during the, the test day. And the grid marshal, and I'm like going like this, trying to clean the windshield. And I'm going real time, real time. And I remember the grid marshal like waving at me like, what are, you, what are you doing, you know? But the reality is, is what I really learned about, you know, you have recall and you have to really control your, your mind. Um, and remember that you will remember things that you maybe not remember. If somebody says what happened, I'm, well, I don't know, but your brain will remember. Um, and I want to just take a quick list of other responsibility things if you don't mind, okay? So the thing is, don't take anything for granted. You just never know. So don't take anything for granted, no matter what anybody says. Take responsibility for yourself. Um, contact reps. As you drive, you go through your career, contact representatives from the series that you're going to be racing in, um, from the tracks that you're going to be racing at, and also the medical people. Um, I remember meeting Dr. Terry Trammell and Dr. Steve Olvey, because I think it was actually a Long Beach. I was kind of wandering around, you know, and I look for where, where is the medical facility at every track you go to? Um, you know, if you don't know, you gotta know where Victory Circle is, and you gotta know where the medical facility is. You never know when you're gonna need them, and you need to know where they are, and you need to meet the people that are, in fact, in charge. I, I don't particularly say meet corner workers, but at least know who the medical people are. I hate it when I say, oh, the corner worker says, I remember I met you at turn three. I'm like, let's not talk about that. Um, Make sure you know where the fire equipment extinguisher is on the car, because every car you're going to go in, there's a different point 
I remember in the probe, I did actually hit the button to release, even though it was not very effective, but know where that is. Um, learn how to take care of your body. Um, flexibility is really important. It'll help you recover better from any kind of injury. I had a herniated disc from that uh, crash at Riverside, and basically, other than a lot of you know, bruises and all of that, that was really the only serious injury. When you're pouring a seat with all the technology that exists today, make sure you have lumbar support. We are sitting in a very awkward, inappropriate position because you're always reaching forward for the steering wheel, which puts your back at, at a at this kind of an angle, at this sort of curvature, and what you want to do is, when they pour that seat, make sure you then all of a sudden just change your body so that you get lumbar support, because over the years that'll really pay dividends and that's, it'll be properly supporting it. Um, ear protections are really important, and don't take shortcuts on, you know, if it's really hot, you're still not, don't wear short sleeve underwear. Um, I've seen too many examples where people do not fully take advantage of all of the equipment that they're supposed to wear. And, you know, I, I've raced so many different types of cars and so many different series, and the, some series require, have different safety requirements. So as, a, as you go from one car to the other, remember I raced a midget and all of a sudden I had to get, you know, some new safety equipment. So do not assume that the safety equipment you show up with is going to be appropriate for a different type of series, a different type of car, and a different type of race. Um, and I'd like to just add another source because, you know, those resources are out there. What we're doing with, the, with um, what Stan 21 has is great. Have, have, have uh, your own sort of network of who you go to to get information. Because you could, you could go to five different people and they're going to be five different answers. But sort of know who the go-to people. You know, Dr. Jacques has, has been my go-to guy forever because I learned that this guy is on top of things and really knows community. what's happening. And so you have to have people that you can really trust out there. Um, and another good source of, from a driver's standpoint is the RDC um, Safe is Fast. They have a great uh, website with a lot of information about all different aspects of how to be safe and how to drive fast. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you, Lynn.